good afternoon from uh, United Nations ESCAP here in Bangkok, Thailand. It's really a pleasure to participate in the PTI Forum Russia 2020 edition uh, to speak about the framework agreement on facilitation of cross-border paperless trade in Asia and the Pacific. I understand you have seen or you will see a short introductory video about this new United Nations treaty. So let me make just a few additional remarks. First, uh, trade digitalization and paperless trade have probably never been more urgent and important uh, than today. The COVID-19 crisis has disrupted supply chains worldwide, and this is in part because trade procedures remain manual with a lot of paperwork and physical contacts at borders and throughout the logistics process. It does not have to be this way, and enabling the electronic exchange of trade data and documents within as well as across borders could go a long way towards making trade contactless and therefore reducing health risks as well as unnecessary delays for all involved. Second, achieving cross-border paperless trade is really not easy and requires good cooperation between countries. So that's what the framework agreement is about. Uh, it provides this neutral cooperation platform to build trust and test different ways to digitalize trade. Russian Federation has been actively involved in the development of the treaty from the very beginning, all the way back to 2012, when drafting started. I'm now happy to report that this treaty that the Russian Federation helped shape is likely to enter into force very soon, as China informed us last month, they have completed all domestic ratification procedures. So I'm really looking forward to Russian Federation also completing its accession process very soon, so that all of you in uh, Russia can help shape the future of paperless trade uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you. Welcome to this second video about the Framework Agreement on Facilitation of Cross-Border Paperless Trade in Asia and the Pacific. In the first short introductory video on the Framework Agreement, which I hope you have already seen, we highlighted the many benefits that can be expected from the digitalization of trade procedures. We also explained how this UN Treaty can help countries address some of the key challenges associated with trade digitalization. In this second video, we further elaborate on the content of the Framework Agreement as well as on how to join it. I hope you will benefit from watching it and I invite you to share it with others. So as you can see, the framework agreement contains a preamble explaining the rationale and context of the treaty, followed by 25 articles. Articles 1 to 16 are substantive clauses covering objective, scope, definitions, general principles, and other action-oriented measures, while articles 17 to 25 are final clauses specifying standard provisions typical of a UN treaty. So you're very much encouraged to read the whole treaty text, as uh, it is not very long in any case. But I focus here only on a few substantive provisions, starting with Article 1, Objective. Article 1 sets out the objective and purpose of the Framework Agreement, which is to promote cross-border paperless trade to make international trade transactions more efficient and transparent, but also to improve regulatory compliance. Article 1 also explained that the objective of the Framework Agreement is to be reached in two ways. By one, enabling the exchange and mutual recognition of trade-related electronic data and documents, and two, by facilitating interoperability among national and sub-regional single window systems or other paperless trade systems. Article 1 makes it very clear 
that the treaty is an enabling instrument rather than a prescriptive one. It aims to promote and facilitate development of paperless trade, but it does not bind countries who become party to exchange data and documents with any other parties. Another key provision of the Framework Agreement is Article 5, which sets out general principles that are supposed to guide all the actions to be implemented by the parties under the treaty. The Framework Agreement is one of the very first international treaties specifically dealing with uh, the issue of facilitating electronic uh, cross-border exchanges. The Framework Agreement uh, addresses the matter by making reference to certain general principles. Those principles are uh, technology neutrality, functional equivalence, and non-discrimination against electronic uh, communications, against the use of electronic communications. In addition to the three principles mentioned by Luca, which are found in almost all countries' national e-commerce or e-transaction laws, other general principles emphasize the need for all parties and actions undertaken under the framework agreement to promote interoperability between paperless trade systems, to facilitate cooperation between the public and private sectors, and to improve trust in electronically exchanging information between the parties. Again, Article 5 emphasizes the need for both trade facilitation and regulatory compliance. Achieving cross-border paperless trade requires close collaboration between the private and public sectors. This has been key to the several blockchain-based pilots we have done to facilitate trade. This, it's great to see this fully acknowledged in the general principles of the framework agreement for cross-border paperless trade in Asia and the Pacific. Let me now briefly touch upon Article 8, which is one of the most far-reaching articles in the framework agreement. The article specifies that parties should work together to achieve mutual recognition of trade-related data and documents in electronic form among themselves. So, the article further specifies that mutually recognizing each other's electronic data and documents will involve countries discussing and ultimately agreeing on a substantially equivalent level of reliability between the data or documents to be exchanged. The article also acknowledges that implementation of the provision in practice may require additional bilateral technical agreements, such as memoranda of understanding and service level agreements. This framework agreement will facilitate this paperless trade and also work out the mutual uh, agreement among the trading partners, which is necessary for us to recognize each other's electronic document in the process. Let me briefly mention Article 11, Institutional Arrangement. This article is important in the sense that it establishes a dedicated institutional structure for the implementation of the Framework Agreement, including for the development of the mutual recognition mechanism mentioned earlier. Specifically, it establishes a Paperless Trade Council and a Standing Committee, to be composed of representatives of the various countries that become party to the treaty. So these bodies will drive the whole work under the framework agreement, setting priorities for participating states and specifying joint actions to be undertaken. In principle, national representatives to these bodies are likely to come from the national committee nominated under Article 6 of the framework agreement. At the national level, Instead of creating a separate national paperless trade committee, it will probably make more sense to assign an existing committee, such as the National Trade Facilitation Committee supporting the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement implementation, or the National Trade Single Window Committee, if it's different. Let me spend a little bit more time on Article 12 which relates to the concrete actions that each country who join the treaty would have to take. The comprehensive action plan foreseen in the Article 12 is really composed of a collective action plan, which will support implementation of individual action plans. 
Very importantly, Article 12.2 makes it very clear that the implementation schedule of individual action will be decided by each country based on a self-assessment of its readiness. Both the collective action plan and the individual action plans are also expected to be living documents and will be regularly updated based on how much progress is made in implementation in each country. The collective action plan is a set of regional level actions developed and adopted by the standing committee for joint implementation among all the parties. So the initial content of the collective action plan will be decided by the PPLS Trade Council, but its expected content can be found in the draft roadmap of implementation of the framework agreement, already developed by the Interim Intergovernmental Steering Group on Cross-Border PPLS Trade Facilitation. As you can see in the draft roadmap, collective actions include development of legal and technical readiness checklist for cross-border paperless trade. Uh, it also includes setting of repositories of pilot projects on cross-border paperless trade with the help of the ESCAP Secretariat, and also development of joint guidelines on mutual recognition of electronic data and documents. These, those are just examples. All these Collective deliverables will help countries make faster progress and promote more harmonized and consistent approaches across all countries involved uh, in the framework agreement. For the individual action plans, each country will have the flexibility to decide which measure they would like to implement, when they would like to implement it, and whether they would require capacity building uh, when implementing it. For those that are familiar with the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement and its category A, B and C commitments um, for developing countries, the treaty is designed in such a way that there are no category A commitment. That is, there are no measures that need to be immediately implemented upon entry into force, besides appointing representative to the Paper Age Trade Council. In fact, the first step after entry into force uh, will be for the Standing Committee and the Paper Age Trade Council to agree on the individual action plan template, as well as preparation of an indicative list of actions corresponding to the level of readiness of each country. So for reference, you may look at the individual action plan template that has been drafted by the Interim Steering Group, which proposes that country list actions they wish to take, if any, under each of the substantive articles, indicating proposed timeline, and need for technical assistance and capacity building for each action and activities. To conclude this brief introduction to the provisions of the Framework Agreement, let me highlight two more provisions. Article 13, Pilot Projects and Sharing of Lessons Learned, and Article 14, Capacity Building. In relation to Article 13, Parties shall endeavor to launch pilot projects on cross-border paperless trade, making use of the technical and legal reference documents and guidelines developed under the Framework Agreement. Many countries in the region already have pilot projects ongoing at the bilateral or sub-regional level, and Article 13 also aims at facilitating the ongoing and systematic exchange of information and lessons learned about these projects to avoid unnecessary duplication and promote interoperability. Complementing Article 13, recognizing that achieving cross-border paper trade requires a gradual approach and a lot of learning, Article 14 is fully dedicated to capacity building. Under that article, technical assistance and capacity building requests from least developed and landlocked developing countries, uh, parties to the framework agreement, will be given special consideration. Generally speaking, in any case, countries who have demonstrated high-level political commitment to paperless trade by joining the framework agreement uh, can reasonably expect uh, to get much easier access to te technical assistance in this area. Let me stop the review of the content of the framework agreement here with an encouragement to go through the entire text as there are a number of other important provisions you may be interested in, such as, for example, Article 6 on the National Policy Framework, Article 7 on Development of Single Window Systems, Article 9 on International Standards, or Article 10 
on relation to other legal instruments enabling paperless trade. What you will find in any case is that the framework agreement is designed as an enabling treaty to support developing countries plan and move towards cross-border paperless trade, and that it does not involve changes in laws and regulations prior to accession. The framework agreement is a framework, meaning it promotes general principle but does not contain detailed legal and technical specifications that parties are obliged to adhere to. Following entry into force, parties will together decide what priorities or tools they will work on to achieve the objective set out in the framework agreement. As the framework agreement is a UN treaty deposited with the Secretary General of the United Nations, Becoming a party is done by sending an instrument of accession or ratification to the UN Office of Legal Affairs in New York. This is typically a, a short letter signed by the head of state, the head of government, or the minister for foreign affairs. Each country has its own domestic approval process in place before such a letter is issued, typically involving uh, stakeholder consultations, submission of a position paper to the cabinet, and approval by the cabinet. Given the enabling nature of the treaty text, parliamentary approval may not be required, but this really depends on each country. Well, I hope this video provided you with a solid introduction to the Framework Agreement. If you would like to know more about the Framework Agreement, please visit our website or contact us at the ESCAP Secretariat. Thank you very much.